see in 1971 and in the late 80s when we had this so-called JVP revolution. We went out and we killed first 20,000 mass or menos, more or less, and the second time about 40,000 young people, children of this country. Why? Because they were a threat to the established government of this country. Now, um, I can see that if there is indeed a revolution, a country must respond. But responding in this brutal manner because the response was not merely a military response, it was a response of pure terrorism. It terrorized the whole nation. One story I can share with you is that a senior person who was involved in this, in the control, at a table made the statement that if 10% of the people that we destroy were hardcore JVPers, we would have broken the back of the revolution. This totally horrified me. It, it, I was depressed for weeks when I heard that. It meant that 90% of those people they killed were innocent. Their only crime was they were young, they were educated, and they had the fire of youth in them. I, as a person, said I could not live in a country that kills its own people, own children, for its survival, and I left. I went away sometime. I wrote a poem which the Honorable Lakshman Jayakuri read into Parliament, into the Hansard, pointing out where we were going wrong in this case. But worse, what that action brought was the removal from our gene pool of the genes for intellect, education, the genes for revolution, the genes that would drive people forward, the genes that produce people who would fight and die for a country, for a nation. We remove this. And as for my genetics, from as a geneticist, you remove 60,000 children from a population as small as ours, you're taking away a large portion of the cleverest of our population. And we shot ourselves in the foot. This is karma vipaka, as the Buddha says. For the action, dastardly action, for the action that of taking away our youth, killing our youth, removing them from our gene pool, we will have to suffer the fate of having a gene pool. Well, you see what we have today. Unfortunately, there is something else. As a Sri Lankan and as a Buddhist, which I find loathsome, and that is, whenever somebody dies, for whatever reason, even a murderer, it is our tradition to give a dane. First, um, a week after they deceased, then a month, and annually. We have lost 60,000 children for our own society, for maintaining our status quo. Has anyone ever given a dane to these people who have departed? Up to today, no. So is it a surprise that as a nation, we suffer what we suffer? We are responsible for that, and yet 
up to date, we are not willing to accept the responsibility for the actions we did. I think that is something that we have to deal with, Sri Lankans will have to deal with in the future to come. Because as Buddha says, karma vipaka, for every action there is a reaction and for that action look what we have today. The separatism that came after the youth insurrection was again something that was building up for some time. It was a similar, uh, shall we say, almost parallel um, political movement that happened in the north where the separatism when they were talking about it on a political platform then descended into a violent struggle if you want to call it. I think it was, it is still pointless but I think what most people fail to realize is that it is rooted in our history. It's rooted in 3,000 years of history. And that is why it is so difficult for us to deal with the subject of finding a common ground, to deal with the subject of extending our hands out, to deal with the subject of trying to understand the other position. Because unfortunately, we are still rooted in these many, many years, thousands of years of history. It is indeed, it should be, the task of the leaders and the politicians to bring us into the modern age, to demonstrate that that history is past, that we have to now forge something into the future that involves all of us. But our shallow politicians have chosen otherwise from both areas, from both sectors. They have chosen division as their power, division as their source of strength. Because, as I told you, because of the past history, this is the easiest, this is the least common denominator, it's the easiest place to go to. It's the shallowest political refuge. And that's what politicians from both sides have been doing, not looking at the future, not working towards bringing us into the future, but dragging us back into the past and opening up the old wounds and the old fears that we brought along with us for all these years and capitalizing on that from both sides. Indeed, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely, humanity, we've been, we'll be wandering around this planet for thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of years. People have come and people have gone. I mean, this whole question of I came first or you came first, is spurious at best. I mean, it's just the refuge of a cheap politician to say, I came first, you came later, you came first, I came first. That's ridiculous. We are a prisoner, or we are prisoners of our own constructs, or as a song goes, we are indeed prisoners of our father's hopes and fears. Fears. Fears is where the politicians move to. Fear is what they use as their tool of power. We are trapped in this thing and until that fear is removed, until we are educated into understanding where we are and we are educated into understanding that there is nothing lost in treating another human being as equal and as a brother. Right? We are lost. We are a nation of people who claim to live by the words of the Buddha. If we do, this would never come about. Never. So it shows as a nation a loss. It shows as a nation that we have failed to live up to what we claim we are Buddhists.